thank you all for being here. Excuse me. <clears throat> well, that doesn't happen too often. Uh, it's a rather eclectic group, um, and, and that's a good thing, because the issue of looking at health and health care providers, I think, has become a rather eclectic topic. We no longer do think, most of us anyway, that um, we can take care of someone's health unless it's in a very non-complex circumstance, and there are not too many of those, by just giving a medicine or just giving a treatment or an intervention. And so for our purposes today, we thought we would just share some of our experiences and beliefs, and many of you have had multiple experiences, and so we're going to leave time to get into a discussion. But for, for me, um, working in a variety of cultures in this country and abroad, I have such respect for the importance of looking at the team of healthcare providers as sort of a, a, a whole, and, and there are very many different perspectives on health, and it takes a lot of negotiation at times and a lot of time that we often don't have, particularly in an acute setting, to work through our differences. But it is more and more essential. I think just hearing uh, Randy Wyckoff this morning and then also hearing from our local folks about how we're going about attending to health and all the things attendant to health and well-being of populations makes it incumbent upon us to really think through the complexities of this and, and work even harder than I'm sure most people in this room already know, it's like singing into the choir, to get out of those silos that our professions or our beliefs about our professions have put us in. Um, one of the first um, <clears throat> extraordinary experiences I had was in Appalachia. And in that culture, understanding that um, the nurses were the primary caregivers because there were so few physicians, but we had to rely on a whole host of other people to ensure that we could go up the creek beds and the hollers and, 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 and see these folks. And that meant everybody from the people who attended to the jeeps to the pharmacist who was going to get the medication right and the one mental health person who was in the, the county whom we could turn to when we had patients who were so depressed, to the school teachers, to the school bus drivers, who were the ones who would call us because they had a child who was throwing worms up on the bus and upsetting everybody. And calling at that point was not picking up a telephone. It was for them to get someplace where there was a phone, maybe one on a, on a creek bed or a holler, and calling into the um, nursing a service, the Frontier Nursing Service this was, who would and then in turn get a, a hold of us in, uh, in our Jeeps in a, uh, on a radio, which sometimes worked, most of the time it did. So my first exposure in being a healthcare provider was understanding at the get-go that it's not just about me giving these people care. I need a whole lot of folks to help me do that. In places here, that was also true. Um, working in Cambodia after the Pol Pot genocide, there weren't a whole lot of, of persons to rely on at the national level that was a genocide. And so there was no minister of health. There was no minister of education. There were, it was strictly the internationals. And among the internationals, we had to team up because we all came from different countries, therefore different cultures, and learn how to work together. One of the things that was so uh, memorable to me was arriving and we had a whole host of patients in a, in a bamboo hospital. And I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to get to know all these patients? And they didn't have any identifying um, bracelet or anything on. And I said to the existing nurses who had been there for a while, we've got to identify them some way. We've got to put a bracelet on. And they said, oh, no, we don't. Because to do that in this culture is going to further frighten them by being um, labeled. And they've already been labeled. And they have survived the worst. You will learn the names. Don't worry about it. And in a great panic, it took me a few days to learn the names. But in fact, you do. You do. And um, so that was just another thing of, of working as a team and realizing how important it was for me to, 
discard my beliefs and listen, in this case, to the other nurses. There, as I say, were not initially national people that we could turn to, but, but that came about. Opposite end of the spectrum, two decades later, being in Bosnia, they had hosts of people who had been trained well. And some of the most important people on those teams for us were uh, not just the nurses or the doctors, but the pedagogues in the schools who uh, could be trained to do uh, uh, trauma counseling with the, the children who had had to flee their villages. It had to do with um, the truck drivers who got the uh, materials to us that we needed. And at that time, it was still during the war. So the truck drivers had to be pretty heroic people because they were coming through places where there were snipers, where there was whatever. So we had a whole host of medical teams in that place because the Balkans had such a, a, a structure in place before the war. And though many physicians and others fled, there was still a, a major cadre there. But all of us realized that we were in a desert unless the trucks could get in with the things that we needed to, to provide the care. So I just bring those kinds of things up to, to um, really push the envelope in our thinking about who are the people that we rely on, not as providers, but in order to provide the care. Uh, Depending on what country you're in, it may be traditional healers, as Carol is working with. It may be the doulas. It may be um, the health navigators that we're using here a lot, the community health workers, lots and lots of folks. And I think our speakers are going to talk about that, both in terms of their personal and their professional experience. I have had the pleasure to know both of them. Ruby Dunlap, who is an associate director of, associate professor, you can be a director too, of nursing at Belmont, has had a long, long history of working in Africa and working here in this, in this city as well, taking students to a number of places, educating uh, students to, to understand cultural issues and understanding the broad scope of health. You can read Ruby's bio in your program, but she has enriched not just the nursing community, but the community as a whole here and the many places she's touched in Africa, which she's going to talk about. And she'll be followed by Patsy Meyer, whom I had the pleasure of meeting through the Tarpleys, because they have gone off together in, in many settings around the globe. And Patsy spoke at a conference in San Diego last fall. And we were so impressed with how she, as a very specific specialty area nurse of the OR, had to become very innovative and take on the role of being a multifaceted healthcare provider within herself. And I think you can talk about some of the people that you have worked with, but really, Patsy's sort of a case study of what you do when you don't have a lot of providers and you become that multifaceted person yourself. So thank you both for agreeing to do this, and Ruby, I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't want to bump this computer. Is it, will it be okay just to shut, it, put the lid down? Okay, is that okay? Okay, I just don't want to accidentally bump a key. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's a great privilege to be here. I think this is the third um, uh, Tennessee Global Health Forum that I've attended. I've always enjoyed myself thoroughly. First time I've spoken or participated in this role. Um, very excited to be here and talk to you about um, task shifting or the um, many faces of healthcare providers around the world. I'm going to end up with uh, a more scholarly, evidence-based uh, reference to task shifting in the world. But I want you to know how I arrived at the, my thinking today. So I'm going to tell you a lot of stories. I don't have any slides. I'm going to just be a storyteller today to tell you how my thinking uh, came to the point it is today. Uh, when I was two years old, my parents took myself, my little brother, and a third brother was born as soon as we arrived in country to Somalia, which you know is the hardcore, no good news kind of country. 
That was in 1955. And my parents were Mennonite missionaries there, and we were stationed about 50 kilometers north of Mogadishu, the capital, in a little village. Uh, no Westerners had ever lived there before. We started off living in what was basically a cardboard house, Masonite, and then eventually a cement block house uh, was built for us. And my father had a boys' boarding, boarding school because girls are not educated formally in the country. Um, at that time, I don't, I'm sure not now either. But um, in any case, my parents were there with three small children, and one of the earliest things that happened to them was late at night, there was a knock on the door, and three or four armed men stood at the door, armed with spears, knives, and they said, we want the midwife. And my father said, there is no midwife here, and they said, oh, yes, there is. We want your wife to come and deliver a baby in the village. And this, this baby is not, the mother cannot deliver it, and we want your wife to deliver it. And I, I vaguely remember the sense of, of alarm, anxiety. My parents talked about what should we do. They, they couldn't say no. You don't say no to armed men showing up at the door and telling you to do something. But my dad was thinking, what's going to happen to her? And uh, so with a sinking heart, he saw my mother disappear into the darkness with these armed gentlemen and, you know, did not sleep. I'm sure he did not sleep. We children were just picking up on the general anxiety, but uh, didn't really know what was going on. But my dad reports when daylight came, seeing my mother with a few children carrying chickens coming back to the um, house, and he said, that must be a good sign. <laughs> and my mother, a um, young woman with three babies of her own, had worked. She successfully got this baby delivered. It was, uh, the delivery was failure to progress. And my mom's only, only um, implements that she took with her were, were a rubber band, a pair of scissors, just general sewing scissors. And she, wore, she had long black hair that she wore, always wore up in a bun and had hairpins. It's keeping her hair up. Those, that's all she had to go and deliver this baby. She describes later going into this little hut packed with women, the laboring woman lying on the ground, you know, fail, failing to progress this delivery. <clears throat> and she, you know, examined the woman and saw the glistening birth membrane that was not uh, ruptured. And she remembered, as a teenager growing up in Appalachia, she had assisted with home deliveries and had remembered the old country doctors saying when the membranes do not rupture, the best thing to rupture a membrane is a hairpin. Okay, mom reached in, pulled out a hairpin, nicked the membranes and the baby was almost immediately born. And that's why the children with the chickens were coming or my, the outcome might have been very different. Fast forward a year or two, and we did get a mission nurse there, and I also learned there was a village, what was called a dresser. Has anybody ever heard of that title, a dresser? Patsy's shake, nodding. The, the government dresser was a young man who was given the job of, of passing out malaria pills, maybe passing out bilharzia medication, uh, perhaps doing wound, some wound care. So in the village, there was a little government clinic that had a few pharmaceuticals and had probably a protocol for, for handing those out. I do not know what kind of training that dresser had at all or what kind of credentials he had. I do know that the nurse who came was a, an American nurse from, um, I believe she was from Indiana, diploma, educated, had a diploma. And when she arrived there, she was basically the primary care, in addition to that dresser in that village. The nurse uh, diagnosed infectious disease, had a microscope. She must have gone to a tropical disease special institute to learn how to do all of this. She diagnosed bilharzia, she diagnosed malaria, she um, treated wounds, 
she birthed babies out in the village. She became the midwife after my mom. I must tell you, after delivering that baby, my mom delivered quite a few babies in that village until the nurse came. That, I'm telling you all of this to um, show you that my mind very early on, even in early childhood, became very open to different types of professionals or non-professionals doing health care. You, you, start, you start off with an openness uh, to that. Now, fast forward to returning to the States and me um, getting my nursing education, and my very first job was an emergency room in uh, Appalachia in a little county hospital, 60 beds. And what that taught me, evening shift nurse, we got everything. What that taught me was observing the uh, residents who were moonlighting to staff be the physician in that ER. I had, uh, who had to be prepared to respond to anything and everything. I had dermatology residents, ophthalmology residents. I was always really glad when I had a internal medicine or car cardiology resident, had uh, orthopedic uh, surgical residents. So in the, the space of the several years that I was in that ER, I observed physicians with different specialties and how they performed and how their, um, they all had the MD behind their name, all same credential, but how their training past the MD and, and their experiences, if you don't use it, you what? Lose it, okay. Um, so I observed, for example, an ophthalmology resident being very unsure about how to suture, how to intubate. A dermatology resident telling me, I don't think I can intubate. We had a code coming in, you know, person needing intubating. So can you see now how my mind was kind of being wondering, well, does the credential auto automatically mean the competency? Where, how do we, the competency and the credentialing may not have a neat one-to-one -one correspondence. Are you all following my growth and development here? Okay, I made a little outline so I wouldn't forget anything. So that was ER. Then fast forward again, I started um, working as a nursing professor at Belmont in 1996. And of course, I went from that sort of loosey-goosey, if you can do it, do it kind of world to being in the world of academic nursing and very, um, a little bit territorial. I think we were. Uh, Dr. Dowdy, Sharon, sitting here is one of my colleagues. Um, nurses having conversations about getting all upset because um, a, uh, an aide was passing out medications in a group home, or a teacher was, or a secretary in a, in a, high, in a school office was handing out the Tylenol, or the, um, or the uh, hyper, you know, um, what's that, ADHD meds, and saying, oh, they need to have, only nurses should be able to do that. Well, that has, that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way, because my feeling was, if you were trained to do something, no matter what the letters behind your name, you should go ahead and do it. If the need was there and the person knew how to do it, just go ahead and do it. <laughs> and, but I became very acutely aware of the credentialing and territor territoriality among nurses, and, um, and I had become a nurse practitioner by now. So I, in the nurse practitioner a world, well, we can do stuff as good as doctors can do it. So. I, was, I would sometimes say to my colleagues, if we're making the argument that nurse practitioners do as well, or sometimes better, than a um, MD in patient care, why are we so guarding about the borders of care at the other end? Why, why couldn't um, a tech who, a farm tech, or a, a personal attendant of some sort hand out meds in a group home or in a, in a um, school. And um, I'm a gerontology nurse practitioner and I have done a lot of nursing home work, which often nursing homes are often staffed only with LPNs, with maybe one RN that's supervising. So I, you can see how I was starting to question that. Now, put me in Africa. 
And in Africa, we heard about the problems in global health from Dr. Wyckoff's excellent, and I love that presentation. And then we heard about the funding. Well, task shifting and the, the assigning of different healthcare responsibilities to a variety of persons is one of the solutions that you read about again and again. So here I am in Uganda uh, teaching graduate nurses. In the entire country of Uganda, which is about the size of Pennsylvania, a little more or less, same population, um, bigger in population and landmass than Tennessee, they had, um, when I first went there, they had maybe three Ugandan nurses with master's degrees and a tiny handful with bachelor's degrees, quite a lot with the equivalent of a diploma, hospital-based nursing education, even more that are called enrolled nurses, which are equivalent to LPN, and even more who are traditional attendants. Now, what, what kinds of things are these people actually doing? Um, while teaching the graduate nurses, we, helped, we looked at the Uganda Nurse Practice Act <clears throat> in every country, <clears throat> excuse me, well, it must be the microphone, Carol, that does it to you. Every, every country has a Nurse Practice Act. Um, nurses in Uganda are diagnosing, um, prescribing. It's not specified in the Nurse Practice Act, but there it is. More than half of the babies born in Uganda are not, uh, the birth is not attended by a trained attendant, but by a village per woman, family member. Huge, very, very high infant mortality and maternal mortality rates. Um, so you look at the situation where you have overwhelming health care needs. You have tiny, tiny cadres of physicians, even um, um, professionally educated nurses, and you wonder who's going to do the health care for the people. The other piece of this, and I became acutely aware of this as a, as a nurse educator in Uganda, is that if an individual, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is educated with an internationally recognized degree of some sort, uh, Bachelor of Nursing Science, uh, MD, the chances of that person staying in country are probably less than half. They, as soon as they get a degree or a credential that can be exported, off they go to New Zealand, Australia, um, UK, Canada, US. So what does that do, especially if the government has helped to fund their education and um, the population there is so needy, when you, you train, you educate, and then they're out of there? It just complicates the um, situation so much. So I wanted to tell you, I, I wasn't, and I'm still not sure, thank you. I'm still not sure how to operationalize or formalize the solution. I just know that one of the solutions to the things Dr. Wyckoff was talking about was the task shifting, being very open-minded about who can do what. And for me, the critical question is, what are the outcomes? And I don't think that has been demonstrated in any literature that I've been able to track down yet. The outcomes of having, for example, nurse midwives do cesarean sections. I don't know what the data are, if the data are even being systematically collected in a credible way. Um, what are the outcomes when you have community health workers um, distribute medications, community health workers, not nurses, not, not clinicians, but community health workers um, diagnose and distribute medications for different things like HIV. You have to you would have to put the outcome data for that compared to no healthcare workers at all. I think it's very um, unfair and um, dangerous maybe to compare the outcomes with a nurse midwife who's doing cesareans with the outcomes of a 
OBGYN doing cesareans in a fully funded, equipped, you know, you need to be c comparing. Are you seeing the task that I'm, as I'm seeing it, the task will be to make sure you're comparing apples with apples and not unfairly comparing the outcomes of people working in very resource limited, training limited uh, environments. You have to compare their outcomes with what happens when there's no, no health care at all. Uh, that's one of the things I'm really convinced of and, and sure that we need to um, be advocating for. The other one um, that I think we need to advocate for as we shift the tasks among a variety of whether it's a community health worker and a nursing associate, whatever, the label doesn't matter as much to me as the quality of the training and the outcome. Um, the other key thing I think that has been demonstrated, at least in India, is the community health worker must have backup support in continuing education. You can't just send, and, and this happened in Uganda, and it was, it's been an abysmal failure, really, to say, oh, the community health worker go out there to an outlying area, and you take care of the problems out there. And don't give them any continuing education or don't give them, have them have a very shaky referral mechanism for things that overwhelm them. So you get a, a uh, midwife out there who all of a sudden has a um, uh, delivery going bad. There needs to be a way of rescuing that. So I think as I've observed and in conversations with my uh, Ugandan coll colleagues and, and reading, it's, it's the credentialing and the education, who's going to be doing what, with what resources, and then what is the chain of referral that they have. If you, if you have a community health worker with a problem that they cannot solve, where do they go to next, and then where do they go to next, and so forth. Um, the one really successful uh, community health worker slash nurse slash physician system that, that I have read about has been in India, where in fact they did that. You have a lay person, a community health worker with minimal training, doing maternal infant education, weighing babies, and, and teaching nutrition, sanitation, and so forth. When she discovers a case, she has a nurse to refer to, the nurse has a maybe a mid-level clinician to refer to, the mid-level cl clinician has a physician, and all, all the way up to the, ending up with a specialist. So as we think about task shifting and, and, and you think about my story and how I've got to, how I'm thinking about that, um, I think those you will discover both in the literature and from my experience, those things are, are really important. One of the key benefits of having non-nurse, non-physician -phys healthcare workers is that they cannot export those. Um, when I hear myself say that, I sound a little bit cruel. But you want to keep healthcare workers in country for the people that need them. A healthcare worker that has task shift, significant task shifting is not a nurse, is not a doctor, is not going to be able to leave the country because those credentials and those, that skill set of that person will not be recognized anywhere else. But they will be key people to improve the health on the ground locally with their own populations. So I think that's, that is um, another benefit. In addition, uh, another thing to keep our eye on, in addition to the backup systems, the uh, continuing education, quality assessment, quality assurance, collecting data to track outcomes, all of those I see as big issues in the task shifting world. Um, you go to the World Health Organization, um, websites, the International Council of Nursing websites, you'll find a lot of information. You put in task shifting in healthcare and you'll get a lot of articles about um, describing case studies and how it's being done, but I still think that we don't have the hard data to track actual outcomes in a public health kind of way. Um, let's see if I've I think I have hit all the high points. I don't know how much time I've taken, Carol, but does anybody, maybe you want to save questions or discussions for later? or 
Anybody have a burning question for me? Something, to, something I said you'd like me to clarify or um, expand on a little? Okay. It's a very exciting time to be in uh, global health, public health. And uh, before I go to my seat, I want you to remind you that our Nurse Practice Acts and our Medical Practice Acts are barely 100 years old in this country. In the 19th century, we were just kind of real loosey-goosey with credentialing and, and you know drawing the boundaries around who could practice what. And our Nurse Practice Acts and our Medical Practice Acts uh, happen to, for two reasons, to put, protect the health of the public. We like to say that, but they also have some guild mentality and territorial, territory protecting mentality mixed in there too. So I, I think we need to remember that as we look at these countries that are doing the best they can, training, you know, different types of, of people to do different types of tasks. So, thank you. GH. Aaron, I thought you said it said the uh, GH. I was going to say, you didn't want to send me up here. No. While he's coming, because I am definitely not uh, the IT person, my name is Patsy Meyer. I currently live in El Paso, Texas. Ruby and I just met today. Come in. IT is always my best friend. Uh, but her story parallels mine in so many ways. When she mentioned the missionary nurse who was diploma trained that came into Somalia, she was talking about me. I am a diploma trained nurse from the 60s who started to work at the world's largest private hospital, Baptist Memorial Hospital, in the, uh, in the late 60s. And the reason we knew we were the world's largest, our tea bags said so. Uh, that is the, the hospital that was demolished uh, a few years ago in Memphis, Tennessee. And my husband was one of those surgery residents who was moonlighting because ER care in the 70s was provided by residents and they were happy to see a young surgery resident present. So today I noticed only one person that even mentioned surgery and this is the young lady back here talking about surgical burden. Uh, this is a very focused uh, uh, talk uh, based on my experiences. I'm an operating room nurse, and when I said that to someone a while ago, they smiled and said, oh, organized. My children and grandchildren affectionately call me the general. Need I say more? So today, you are going to see what I have experienced in 40 years of working in a global situation. My husband and I, he's currently a pediatric surgeon, but he started life as a general surgeon. And even before that, he was a senior medical student. And for his elective in 1971, we worked for three months in the occupied territory and the Gaza Strip. And we continue today to work in volunteer situations. This is a picture of me last year in, uh, in Africa, and in a couple of months, we'll be leaving a couple of weeks actually at the end of April we'll be going to Mozambique we continue to do our volunteer work we spent an, a number of years in Nigeria as missionaries from 1982 to 1999 but as you well know, this is a very generous statement as saying that 80% of humanity lives on less than $10 a day. I mean, we all know it is much, much less. When we first started in the 70s, this was called the third world. I'm going to the third world. Then I became part of the developing world. Then I came back in the 90s and learned that I was working in a less developed country. And now, of course, we call ourselves low resource areas. But no matter where it is, we meet the same kind of problems. My experiences are within faith-based hospitals and university hospitals. As I said, from 82 to 99, we were in the Baptist hospital system in Nigeria and worked with the Tarpleys. If any of you are Vanderbilt based, you know the great name of Dr. John Tarpley and Maggie. And when we came back to the U.S. in 1999, we started going on short-term mission endeavors Working, prime, working always with pediatric surgical care and pediatric, pediatric surgical education. Uh, 
My husband is now a professor of surgery, and some people call this a low resource area. We live in El Paso, Texas. We, are, my husband is part of the first medical school to ever be established on the border in the U.S. of A., and the first medical school to be established in the last 30 years. And we're part of that venture, and some days he calls home and says, deja vu, remind me that I'm in the U.S. of A. Because even in that situation, the other day he called me and said, where are we? We don't have any electricity out here. Now, that is unusual. We, we usually do have electricity. But a recurring theme around the world, as you heard Ruby allude to in Uganda, and especially in the operating theater, there's a lack of reliable, essential things, water, electricity, supplies. But we always meet, no matter where we go, an abundance of underserved and appreciative people. And since we're working primarily with children, we're meeting appreciative parents. And then we always meet OR staffs who are functioning every day with those particular situations, not just for the two weeks that I'm there. And we meet staffs that are eager to learn. I learned in a bombshell when I went into the OR in 1982 that it was a different world than the one I had functioned in in the U.S. I had never gone into the, into the OR and said, is there water today? Is there electricity? If not, is there fuel for the generator? Are the instruments sterile? Are the sutures available? And how in the world am I going to make it work? How can I improvise? And that's basically what I want to share with you today, very quickly, some ways that I learned from my personal experience of improvising. It took many years before we were smart enough to say, let's dig a well right outside the OR. That works. Send the cleaner out, get the water, pour it in a barrel. You even see I was uh, ingenious enough to, to even put on a, a, a little spigot and the elbow thing. If you guys remember your OR experience, any of you nurses, the doctors did not want to touch the spigot with their hand after they scrubbed, so that's what I had on there. A generator to provide backup uh, electricity when you have no uh, electricity in the OR. Environmental. In Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a phenomenon called harmattan. It means that the dust from the Sahara is blowing down. It does not say, I cannot go in the OR. It comes into the OR too. How do you function with that? When it finally does rain, in the rainy season, most of those countries, we have a dry season, sub-Saharan, and a wet season. The wet season comes, a little bit of water, you come back in 30 minutes, you'll have a bowl full of ants, and you'll have fungi growing in the cleaner's scrub brush. But with a little planning, as our family planning clinic did, uh, thought ahead here on this sign, we found in Oboma Shaw we were able to survive. We didn't look like we were in Dallas, Texas. We just survived. We learned how to make do. I was just absolutely livid because they had no controlled access to the OR. I mean, I thought I was going to look up and see a camel walking in or a donkey. So I said, we've got to have a system. And so the uh, carpenter came up and said, here's your bell, Ma. So that was the bell the, the patients were supposed to ring. Dr. Tarpley had already been doing uh, improvising for years before we got there. You notice the extraction setup we had in the early 80s. Those are rocks in those buckets. This is a colostomy bag that was designed. I call it the Tarpley bag. I have introduced it in Uganda. I have introduced it in Ethiopia. I have gone around the world carrying my little plastic bags, finding a little tin can in the country where I am that will meet the, the size of the stomas of the children and showing them how they can make their own colostomy bags. I have told them you do not have to have gloves for removing bandages. You can use market plastic bags. And it's really, we really should do it in the U.S. because after you remove it, then you fold it up inside your bag and throw it away. It's really better than gloves and a whole lot cheaper. Now, you heard this morning Dr. Wyckoff say, with the children under five, the causes of death, 36%, what was that? Congenital anomalies, congenital difficulties, newborn complications. In that part of that, there's an uh, anal rectal malformations. You all, if those of you not medically related, 
little kids born without an anus. It's, you know, you're not going to live very long. To correct this in the U.S., you would want to have a nice headlight. You would want to have a, something called a pina stimulator, that box that my husband is standing next to, that uh, a guy named Alberto Pena uh, invented, that for $3,000 you can buy this. And when you use this little gadget and you stimulate the area of that little virgin bottom, the muscle will wink where God placed it. It's there somewhere. But before you can do an anoplasty, you got to know where to place the little gadget. Well, that thing that Don is standing there with costs $3,000. Now, we cannot go around the world giving out $3,000 pina stimulators, but we go teaching the people who are doing the pediatric surgery how to do this procedure. And they've got to have a little stimulator. We learned that a $50 nerve stimulator that you see anesthesia using when their patients are waking up, and a piece of thermostat wire that I buy from Lowe's that I strip off the ends, connect it, that makes a perfect anal stimulator. And we go educating these young surgeons, ever who's been designated as a pediatric surgeon, and as Ruby said, it is not a young man who is or woman who has completed a fellowship. It is just someone that has been given the pediatric surgery book that's about 10 years old, and they said, you are now the pediatric surgeon. So we go teach them this procedure, show them that they can use this and they have a little wink. You know, the plastic surgeons go around the world saying one smile at a time. I've been looking for a cute little logo I could put on our lab coats, but so far I haven't really come up with one that would really be culturally appropriate. The closest was one wink at a time. But we have learned that you can make do. We go now primarily to university teaching hospitals. This is in a major, well, the teaching hospital in an East African country. Then this is one of their better ORs because one of the globes still works in their OR light. Because of that, we learned that you can go to the sports store here in the US of A and buy one of those nice little torches that you wear on your head, and there you have your OR light. Anesthesia in Nigeria, we did not have oxygen. We learned we could use room air with a compressor to pass the anesthesia gases. We learned that if the sun is shining, you've always got an x-ray box. Often we would get sutures from the US of A. You have collected materials and taken with you on mission endeavors. But They've got to be sorted. They've got to be used appropriately. And often they are really not very helpful when they get there. We've learned that fishing line, monofilament nylon, you know, the people that make the suture call it a different name, but it's still a monofilament uh, nylon. And 20 pounds, this weight, is a perfect zero. Six pounds is a perfect three. 30, which is used for skin closure. Put it in your little packets, put it in the autoclave, sterilize it, whammo, you're good to go. Thread it on an old needle board. Now, I told you that I started working in the 60s. I started working in a hospital, that Baptist hospital I told you about. We had to pin our own sponges. We had to cut our own cottonoid. We had to thread our own needles. I was trained and was able then to share this training with technicians and nurses that we work with around the world. There are places today where saline is still made. What is saline? Salt water solution. Sterilize it. I'm happy to report in most places in the world today, I do not see this. And that's because of China and India supplying the rest of the world. But we no longer see as many syringes and needles and gloves reused. And I am very, very thankful to report that. But there are places that they still do. Gloves are washed at the end of the day, powdered. Remember, gloves used to have powder. They still do if you've washed them by hand or they, you won't ever get them on. There are places we still do that. The red sharps container does not look the same the entire world. Sometimes an, a used uh, tennis ball will work, a container will work just as well. Every place we go, I still see people cutting sponges, cutting gauze. This is in Kosovo, Africa. 
I fold gauze with OR staffs around the world. Don is over there working. Once you get the case going, it takes a long time to do an anoplasty. That's when the nursing education takes place. We're over there folding our gauze and talking and learning what their situation is like. I'm very, very thankful for sunshine because around the world, often that is about the best thing you have to put your tables and things out for, for the good old sun to at least get them warm and hopefully clean them. Recyclables are in around the world. Making your linens works. The gauze, the, the, the caps, all the linens that are used are made by a tailor and then autoclave. But some things they cannot make. They cannot make a sterilizer. Some things must come from abroad. Of course, we do know what do we give away in the U.S.? things we really don't want, right, and can't use anymore. So often the materials that we receive uh, look like this. In every place that I now go, one of the first things I do before we start operating is find out if they have what they call in many parts of the world a divider, or we call it a power source, because there's usually only one outlet in the room that will work. And if you're trying to plug in your cautery, you're trying to plug in your headlight if you have one, and the other things that you're trying to use, it's essential that you have a power stick. And so to, that is one of the first things I will buy and gift the department where I'm working. And if there's not a suction, make sure there's a foot suction, essential for putting someone to sleep in anesthesia. As I told you, we're doing anal rectal malformation repairs. We're doing anoplasties. Then you have to dilate the child. Dilators are expensive. If you send them home with the mom, they will never return. You know what that is on the bottom? That's a candle. I take the candles, I show the staff how to cut them so that they fit and look just like the 16 millimeter. And the most rewarding part of making do and, and doing is seeing someone that you have taught replicate in their own practice. So in Nigeria, one of our graduates went out and he started his his clinic, and he had an operating theater, and he wanted a table that went up and down like the old 1080 American supply we had. And so what did he put on his? That's a jack from a car, but it works. He can move his table to the different heights. Now, sterilization is always a problem because you've got to have electricity for that autoclave to work. Well, you've got to do that for your linens, but for your instruments, in many parts of the world, soaking instruments in alcohol or formaldehyde or other solutions is one of the ways that they are sterilized. So you either have the autoclave where you put the instruments, the, the, the objects that you want sterilized, into the bottles. Thank you. And in one country where we were working, they were using the instruments from the table to retrieve their sterile supplies out of the common container. Ruby's making a face over here. They didn't even know about the concept of a sterile transfer forceps. Younger educated nurses in the U.S. have never seen transfer forceps. But they're essential and they work. So I introduced sterile transfer forceps so that they can retrieve the instruments either from the soak or from the steamed uh, sterilized uh, supplies. Thank you. Now, we all know that cleaning the skin is important preoperatively, right? And the doctor's scrubbing. But iodine is costly. So we did a randomized prospective study, and it was published by the World Journal of Surgery in 2001. And as you see here, we compared two preoperative skin prep techniques. One got market soap and some alcohol. In the other one, we used the expensive iodine preparation, betadine. Okay, here's our baby would come in. I'd give him a pre-wash just to get the soap off. Then he would be washed with a, with a market soap and then I had, uh, uh, alcohol, or, he would get the, or he'd get the betadine prep. Same with the doctors. The overall postoperative wound infection rate 
was 5.5. Look at the difference. The market soap had 5.1, and the iodine solution was 5.9. So we learned using our limited resources in our hospital, it was better to spend it somewhere else than to be paying for imported iodine solution for skin prep. And we can actually prove that with a scientific study, which is kind of unusual for us. My swan song in 1999, as I was leaving the Baptist Hospital, was I have found some money. So I had friends giving me some money, and I wanted to leave them with a real OR, controlled access, beds that worked, tables that worked. Always close the door. Leave it. Don't let anybody in here. Children's Hospital in Dallas gave me two complete sets of OR equipment. I had the electrocardery, I had the table, I had everything. And this was what I left them in 1999. And it is still there. I would not show you the picture of what it looks like today, but it is still functioning. And care, surgical care, is still being given. I was determined that we would do everything we would move up a notch. We had been surviving, but we would move up a notch. We would make sure our cases were posted. We would do identification of children. I throw this one in here. You never know in some countries in what condition your child will even present in the OR. This child is in Albania. There's about six layers of clothing on that child that you have to go through till you get down to the little kid. That is not the problem in Africa. Even identification, you, somebody was worried about giving people the little name bands. Well, in, uh, in many parts of Nigeria, you just have to open them up and their name is tattooed there. We tried to educate, do things the way they are done in the rest of the world. But through it all, we learned that things that you don't expect to see, you often see, and yet you find that surgical care is given and that the patients do well. One of the things you don't often see in the U.S. is a surgeon lying down on the table to give blood so that the child can be operated on. You don't often see a stove in the middle of the OR it is in Afghanistan. It provides heat and heats your solutions, as you see the solution warming in the basin. You don't often see pizza right there in your workroom, as you do in Albania and Kosovo. Ethiopia, they cook next door. I smell them in the university hospital. I smell the injera and wat cooking all day. You must have been to the university hospital. There they are, serving the injera and wat every day. Mongolia, the ladies all wear high heels. I was the only person in there in sensible orthopedic uh, nursing shoes. And many parts of the Africa, child care is not an issue. Just the child is there with you. They don't have to worry about paying for child care, as we heard this morning. The fly catcher, the fly swatter, essential. Cobbled together operating room tables, again, in a university hospital in East Africa. And this suction machine wasn't working. I couldn't quite figure it out. Then I figured it out. The water was in the machine, not in the collection bottle. So you just poured the water out, put the bottle back on, and it worked. Perceived need. This is where I'm coming to the end. This young man presented to us. He had been locked in his home because obviously he had evil spirits. We know he had a cleft lip. He was 20 years old. My husband is a pediatric surgeon, not a plastic surgeon, but he can read. So he did a plastics repair on this guy, repaired his, his lip, and the nose was a little flat. Don wasn't real excited about it. Don heard that a plastic surgeon was coming, and he sent word to the village to this young man and said, there is a specialist coming that can fix your nose. And this young man looked at Don and said, what's wrong with my nose? There was not a perceived need in his life. So it is with us when we go as volunteers. There must be a perceived need in the people that you are working with or you're never going to change anything. My primary focus in working with OR technicians and OR nurses and my husband's with working with the young residents and doctors is establish a relationship first. Know who you are working with. And before you go in with your Western ideas, and of course I now live in Texas, we know all the answers. Evaluate the existing procedures before you suggest any change. 
The first day, you don't say a word. Even second, third. And then when you do, try to introduce appropriate supplies and technologies that can be replicated when you are gone. Of course, you have all these gadgets with you, but when you go home, they go home with you because your home hospital doesn't want you to leaving behind all of your $3,000 worth of surgical uh, supplies. Try to see what you can do and educate as opportunities present. As you are folding gauze, you have greater opportunities for educating and sharing than you do in any other time. I work in, uh, I was working in Mexico. I was riding the uh, Los Limousines, the buses down into Mexico into about four years ago, and our host surgeon does not want us come coming right now. But I developed this book that I found online, and online is a marvelous thing. I found this infection preve uh, prevention online course that I just clicked and it went into Spanish. And I take it down and I educate the nurses in, Al in Aldama, Mexico, in the state of Chihuahua. I have done the same. I've taken this little book with me around the world. This was in Cameroon, Mongolia, uh, that's Albania and different other places that I don't have pictures of, the rewards of service. People often say, well, do people, are they really appreciative? And I always say, well, yes, but there's a story I share that this young man presented one day and he said, I can't ride my bicycle to work like everybody else. And so my husband looked at him and he thought, hmm, a couple of osteotomies and some screws and voila, he looks like everybody else. So he comes back to me and he says, please, Ma, now that you have fixed my legs, where is the bicycle? That's rewards of service. But the primary rewards of service are the things that we will never know. These young surgeons in training in Bingo, Cameroon, received my infection control book and prevention book, worked with Don for the two weeks we were there, we got to know them, we established relationships. These young men are from different countries in Africa. This is a pan-African surgery training program. And they will go out all over that part of the region of Africa, hopefully sharing the techniques that we have taught them and hopefully making it a better place for surgical care for children. Thank you.